Hi everyone and welcome to Inspire St James Clerkenwell and our online service. My name is Mark Jackson and I am one of the ministers in charge here and a particular warm welcome if this is your first time connecting with us. Great to have you with us as we celebrate Palm Sunday today. You'll find an order of service in the description below as well as a link to the DIY jam material for parents and families for later on in the service. As we continue to think today about the question we started looking at last week, where is God in this pandemic? Well, let me begin with some words from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? O Lord, open up our lips and our mouth shall sing your praise. Well, let's do that now in our first song, Praise to the Lord. we adore you Lord because you are great and worthy of our praise and you hold us in your hands will you join in with the words and the actions uh, to this next all age song our God is a great big God our God is a great big God our God is a great big God and he holds us in his hand our God is a great big God our God is a great big God, our God is a great big God, and he holds us in his hands. He's higher than a skyscraper, and he's deeper than a submarine. 
He's wider than the universe, me on my wildest dreams. And he's known me and he's loved me since before the world began. How wonderful to be a part of God's amazing plan. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God and he holds us in his hands. He's higher than a skyscraper and he's deeper than a submarine. He's wider than the universe and me on my wildest dreams. And he's known me and he's loved me since before the world began. How wonderful to be a part of God's amazing plan. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God and he holds us in his hands. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God. Our God is a great big God and he holds us in his hands and he holds us in his hands and he holds us in his hands. Yes, God is great even when things are really tough. God is great. He helps us and he cares for us and sometimes we find as human beings, we can be like God, helping and caring for others. But often, we're not like that, are we? And that's what the Bible calls sin. It says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And you can see how that makes sense. It would be silly to claim we're perfect. But what do you do when you realise you're not perfect? Do you try to cover it up? Do you take it out on others? Or do you own it? Come before God, the only one who can forgive you, and ask for his mercy. We're going to do that now, but first a moment to reflect on the past week before we ask the Lord for mercy. sing together. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, This is how we know we are forgiven. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. This is the good news. Thanks be to God. Well, it's great to have children joining with us. And so now I'm going to hand over to Andy Hood, our youth and children's minister, who's going to help us all think about Palm Sunday, what it means, and why it's such good news for us today.
Hip hip hooray! Hi everyone, it's Andy here and I'm having a party. Woohoo! Not because it's someone's birthday and not because someone's come to visit me. That would be against lockdown rules. No, I'm having a party because today is Palm Sunday. What's Palm Sunday? Well, on Palm Sunday, we celebrate Jesus coming as God's special king, riding a donkey into Jerusalem. The people who were there celebrated. They cut palm branches off the trees and threw them in the road to make a carpet for Jesus. They cheered and shouted, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. It's God's special king. He's come. He's come to rescue us. He's come to rule the world. He's come to put everything right. Now, in these days of lockdown, one of the sad things is that we can't celebrate like we normally would. If it's our birthday, we can't invite people over to, for our party. And we can't have granny or grandpa or our friends over and celebrate with them. But on Palm Sunday, we have something that we can always celebrate. On Palm Sunday, remember that God's special King Jesus has come. King Jesus has come and he's rescued us from sin and death. King Jesus has come and he rules the whole world, even over coronavirus. And one day, King Jesus will put everything right. And that's something worth shouting about, isn't it? Something worth celebrating. And so that's what we're going to do now. When I say go and not before, what I want you to do is celebrate that Jesus is king as loudly and as wildly as you can. You might want to high five your mum or dad or do a little dance or just shout at the top of your voice. However, you want to celebrate that Jesus is king. OK, three, two, one, go. And back together in five, four, three, two, one. Brilliant. On Palm Sunday, we remember something we can always celebrate. That God's special King, Jesus, is here. You'll learn loads more about his arrival into Jerusalem on a donkey when you do the jam session I sent through to your parents. But for now, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus, your special King. Thank you that he's rescued us from sin and death. Thank you that he rules over the whole world. And thank you that one day he'll put everything right. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to continue praying now together as a church family. And so it's over to Jane. Who's going to lead us in our prayers. Hi, I'm Jane here. I'm going to lead us in a series of short prayers to our Heavenly Father. If you would like to make them your own, please join me in the Amen. Loving Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for who you are. Our world is precarious and constantly changing, but you are our rock. You never change. You are always faithful and just. Your words never fail. Your purposes and plans can never be thwarted. You will never leave us or forsake us. Father, we are so thankful that whatever storms are raging around us, you are there holding us fast. And we thank you that one day Jesus will return and herald a new heavens and a new earth, where sickness and tears and death will be no more, and where your children will live with you forever as you intended from the beginning. Thank you, Lord. Help us to trust you more and more because you are the trustworthy one. In Jesus name. Amen. Lord, thank you for the unexpected blessings of the COVID-19 lockdown that many of us are experiencing. For more quality time with friends and family, even if it's only over screens, for a greater sense of community, 
for the lessons that you are teaching us in how to be better neighbours, for learning a greater dependency on you as the source of all life. Father, please teach our hearts during this time so that we can emerge from the lockdown more like Jesus and better witnesses to the gospel. And Father, we pray for all of those who are having a difficult time, for those facing uncertainty, illness, isolation and grief. Father, please comfort them and please strengthen them and please help us to be your hands and feet to bring love and hope. Father, we thank you for the online devotionals and the online services. Father, we pray for opportunities to share them with colleagues and friends who might otherwise not step inside a church. Father, we long for these opportunities to bear fruit and for friends and neighbours who we had lost hope for to turn to Jesus in this difficult time. And Father, we thank you for everyone involved in the health profession, for the bravery and commitment of nurses, doctors, porters, pharmacists and all the other frontline workers. Father, please keep them safe. Please give them wisdom and compassion for difficult decisions. And please may they turn to you for comfort and strength in the dark and difficult times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord, help us to count our blessings. We have so many and we have the greatest blessing of all in knowing you through Jesus. Please may our joy and thankfulness in you be a real testimony to the gospel to everyone we come in contact with. For Jesus' glory and his great name. Amen. Finally, let's all join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Thanks very much, Jane, for leading us in our prayers. So much to be thankful for right now, in particular the response across the country to COVID-19. You may have heard of the NHS asking for a quarter of a million volunteers to help out and then three times that number um, signing out. And I caught up with Diana Carolina, a member of the church family here, to hear about the work she's been involved in to provide aid for those in need. And we're going to listen to that interview now. Diana, great to have you with us this morning. Thanks so much for being willing to share some of what you've been up to these past few weeks. Now, if I've got this right, you're one of the mutual aid coordinators for the Clerkenwell and Bunhill wards. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means exactly and what your role is in it? Yes, no, absolutely, my pleasure. Um, so the mutual aid group, um, so I, I think a lot of people will probably be aware that, that there's uh, community groups that have been forming and we have a community group, a completely volunteer group in Clerkenwell and Bunhill. And because of church, um, I thought it'd be a great idea to get involved with the Clerkenwell area. Um, so we have uh, about seven coordinators, what we call ourselves, and we have been organising volunteers to help the people in need. So it may be people because of their age, they're not able to go out and so they need groceries or they need their medicine picked up from the pharmacy or some post collected. Um, and they've uh, given me the role of being a matchmaker and it's, uh, and it's definitely not a dating site. So what I have to do is uh, because we have um, 350 volunteers, we're actually now covering quite a lot of the streets in Clerkenwell and Bunhill. And when a person calls me in need saying, I need help, um, a lot of the time they call when they're seriously in need. I think because of the Br British nature, you only really ask for help when you seriously need it. So it tends to be people who have run out of food are starving and then absolutely needing to call someone for help. So they'll, they'll call me and say, I need help. 
I'm hungry, I don't have any food, can you please help? And I'll find a volunteer who lives close to them who is able to go do some a, a grocery run for them. Uh, so I, I tend to refer to myself as a call centre. So calls come in to me. I match up people and uh, we have the other coordinators and they also have different roles within the community. And how many um, households have you managed to help out so far? So far, we've managed to help 118 households. Um, and that's over a period of two, two weeks, two and a half weeks. Amazing. So, I mean, in terms of all these volunteers, you've got the households you, you've reached. It's brilliant. How are people responding to it? How are you finding it just being involved, you know, in such an important work like this? Yeah, no, um, it, it's been incredible. Uh, the, the response, so because people call us uh, when they're seriously in need, um, they have been so utterly grateful and, and the comments that we've received are things like, you're my lifeline, um, it was such a relief getting your leaflet through the door, I don't know what I would have done without you guys, I am so grateful. There's even people saying, when all of this is over, I'm going to take you out for a coffee, all of you guys, because I'm just so grateful you saved my life. And from my perspective, it's, it's been such a blessing for me personally. So I, my contract ended in February um, and uh, I, I was really struggling with the thought of not having a job. Um, and also not being busy in a period where you have to be indoors. And I'm not very good at um, being idle thumb and not having, being busy and not having a lot to do because I come from um, a work environment where it's quite intensive. And it's been such a blessing that um, I've been able to focus on the mutual aid group and, and help people and actually through helping people it's really helped me because I'm busy um, it, 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 to me it feels like um, I'm helping such a worthy cause of people who are lonely people who are in need and just they're so grateful to, to hear that you are able to help them so it brings me such joy um, to, to feel that we have we have the ability to help these people. Mm -hmm. I'm conscious you just mentioned there how busy you are and you're sort of working 8 a.m. to, to 7 p.m. Um, and you're so passionate about it and you're receiving all this joy and this blessing. But can you say a little bit about what really drives you um, in, in this? You know, what motivates you to be involved in, in something like this? Um, so I'll, I'll give an example. Um, I, I received a call from a rough sleeper and uh, they, they, they made a call such as, uh, they made a comment such as, um, is there anything that you do for rough sleepers? Obviously, we don't matter. You know, we fall through the system. Nobody cares about us. Um, and, and for me, that, that really drove me to not only want to help rough sleepers, but want to help everybody because um, Jesus cares about all these people. Um, and, and for me, for me, it was so important to show the rough sleeper that because I'm a Christian, um, Jesus loves him and cares about him and he does matter to Christ. Uh, and hence, hence the passion to, to want to help these people. Um, it's, it's not because I love people and I'm wonderful and great. It's actually because Christ loves all these people. Um, and, and Christ wants to see them saved. Thanks, Dinah. Thanks for, sh for sharing that. I mean, as a church family, we're really keen to be helping out in any way we can at this time. I know many members of the church family are already sort of signed up on the mutual aid group. But for any of us who are hearing about this for the first time, um, what would you say to us about how we could potentially help out and join in as well? Yeah, no, absolutely. So there's lots of mutual aid groups. So if you don't live close to Clerkenwell or Bon Hill, you can join your local mutual aid group and I'm sure that they would be massively grateful about you joining. Um, I don't live close to Clerkenwell or Bon Hill and I did join the Clerkenwell group, um, which means you don't have to be in the area to be able to help um, our church area. 
because actually just through calling people and being a friend to people, it makes such a big difference. A lot of these people are lonely, um, are suffering from high levels of anxiety and depression. Uh, and, and actually you can help through just giving them a phone call. And, and the reality is that us as Christians, we have the best message of hope that we can give all of these people who are really scared. And I've had a lot of conversations where people have said, I'm really scared of dying. I don't, I don't want to die. I'm really scared. And I, and I think that as a church, what a wonderful opportunity this is to be sharing the gospel, to, to be giving hope to people in a time where, where it all feels so hopeless. Mm. Well, amen to that. Look, Dana, thanks so much. Can I pray for you and pray for the work now? Yes, no, absolutely. Let me pray. Father, thanks so much for all the work that's happening, well, across the nation in response to COVID-19 and wanting to help out uh, those who are in need. Thank you for all these volunteers in this particular ward in Clerkenwell and Bun Hill, all the households that have been able to be visited so far. And we pray on for Diana and her team and all the volunteers that you would give them the strength and perseverance um, they need right now each day. And we pray for any of us who are hearing this for the first time and being prompted by you to think, well, how can we um, sign up, um, or join in, even if we're not living particularly uh, in the area? And we pray that through all this, people will be cared for and the love of Christ will be shown. And we ask it for his name's sake. Amen. Lord, Make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where, where there, there is sadness, joy. joy. A, A divine, divine master. master. Grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand. To be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. And it's in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it's in dying that we are raised to eternal life. Amen. Amen. <laughs> In a moment, Ella Sutherland is going to bring God's word to us as she reads Luke chapter 7. And then Pete is going to preach from that as we continue to consider this question, where is God in this pandemic? Before that, let me pray for us. Father God, we thank you very much that you are a speaking God and we hear your voice today as your word, the Bible, is read and preached to us. Father, we need your voice. Would we hear it, see you drawing near to us and offering the hope that we desperately need? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's reading is found in Luke chapter 7 verses 11 to 17. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier they were carrying him on, and the bearer stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praise God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi, my name is Pete Nicholas and I'm one of the ministers at Inspire St. James Clerkenwell. Well, last Sunday and this Sunday, we're grappling with a question that we're all feeling, even if we might frame it in slightly different ways. Where is God in this pandemic? In 1 Thessalonians 4, the Apostle Paul 
talks about the way that when Christians grieve, they do not grieve as those who have no hope. And in saying that, notice that he's not saying that Christians don't grieve, as though there's some glib answer that believing in God just makes all the problems of this world go away. No, he's saying there's a danger of disengagement, that is of not grieving, of not engaging with the problems of this world. But there's also a parallel um, danger of despair, that is that as we grieve, we do not have hope. So disengagement and despair are two errors we might fall into. Now, as you think about this question, it might be that you're framing it in a particular way and you're wondering, does God even exist if there's so much suffering and evil like coronavirus in the world? The philosopher David Hume, writing in the 18th century, penned these words as he framed that problem. Were a stranger to drop suddenly into this world, I would show him as a specimen of its ills, a hospital full of diseases, a prison crowded with malefactors and debtors, a field strewn with carcasses, a fleet floundering in the ocean, a nation languishing under tyranny, famine or pestilence. Honestly, I don't see how you can possibly square this with an ultimate purpose of love. There's something we all feel to that question. If there is a God, doesn't he care? Is he able to do something about it? And if he does care and he is able to do something about it, then why doesn't he do something about it? Or to put it another way, doesn't the presence of so much suffering like coronavirus point to the fact that there is no God behind it all? There is no ultimate purpose of love in the universe. Well, what I want to do today is to look at this instant in Luke chapter 7 where Jesus raises a widow's son and to see how this helps to give us some answers, some engagement with this question. First of all, we're going to see compassion to those who are suffering. And secondly, we're going to see hope of an end to all suffering. Let's look firstly at compassion to those who are suffering. The situation as we join the passage in Luke chapter 7 is desperate. Nain is a town, it's about 14 kilometres away from Nazareth, so Jesus would know it well. And as he approaches the town, he comes across a woman who has lost everything. The death of anyone is tragic. We're picking that up in the news at the moment as people die of COVID-19. But the death of a child is particularly tragic. Nicholas Waltersoff wrote these words shortly after the death of his son. It's the neverness that is so painful. Never again to be here with us. Never to sit with us at the table. Never to travel with us. Never to laugh with us. Never to cry with us. Never to embrace us as he leaves for school. Never to see his brothers and sister marry. All the rest of our lives we must live without him. Only our death can stop the pain of his death. That was what the widow was facing, the neverness of death. She not only had to grieve the passing of her husband, but now she was grieving the death of her son. But there was more tragedy than just that. In a traditional society, her status and her economic well-being would be bound up with the male figures in her household. So now she's also facing a very uncertain future and a loss of status and reputation in society with the passing of her male heir. How is she going to cope? And this is the point about suffering. It's never abstract. It's always personal. I wonder what it is that you're facing as we all grapple with lockdown at the moment. Maybe you're grieving the loss of a loved one, uh, one of the people who tragically has died as a result of coronavirus. Maybe you're fearful about the health of loved ones, maybe elderly parents that you're worried about. Maybe you've lost your job and you face an uncertain future. Maybe there's nothing particularly that's actually wrong, but you're just really struggling to cope with lockdown, the isolation, or maybe strain in relationships at home. Whatever it is, suffering is never general. It's always very particular and it's personal. And therefore, every one of us as human beings, no matter our ethnicity or age or background, we all need a philosophy of life that helps us to be able to engage with and cope with suffering when we face it. Well, into this situation, Jesus comes. Let's look at verse 12 and see how he responds. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. 
That phrase, his heart went out to her, is hugely significant. In the original, it literally means he was moved with compassion towards her. And in scripture, compassion always has two aspects to it. First of all, a very gut level, visceral engagement with the tragedy and the pain of a situation. And secondly, a deep desire and intention to do something about it. Now, why is that important? Well, did you notice um, where the funeral procession was going? We're told that it was going outside of the town gates. That's important because in the Old Testament, anything that was bound up with the things that were wrong in this world, spilled blood, disease or death, if you came into contact with it, it made you ceremonially unclean. It was a way that scripture communicates that there are profoundly wrong things in this world. And when they touch us, we know deeply, we feel that they're wrong. So Jesus, as he comes into this situation, validates our deepest intuitions. That suffering isn't just the way the world is, certainly not the way the world should be. It's not just the natural order, but it's wrong. Deep inside of us, we say it shouldn't be like this. And Jesus, when he's moved with compassion, validates that. He says, yes, it shouldn't be like this. The world should be very different. Listen to these words of C.S. Lewis. My argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call something crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing the universe with when I was calling it unjust? Jesus' compassion means at least two things. First of all, it speaks to the way that suffering shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be in God's world. And secondly, it gives us comfort and care when we're going through suffering. To speak to the first point, can I ask, if you don't believe in God, by what standard do you say that there is suffering in the world and that things shouldn't be like this? The tragedy of the natural order is that if you look at it, you'll see disease and death and pain. That's just part of the way the world is. It seems to be the circle of life. If there is no God in heaven, then it's just the way the world is. We might not like it, but we have to get used to it. But our deepest intuitions are much stronger. They say it shouldn't be this way. That implies an ultimate purpose, and that only makes sense if there's someone who gives us ultimate purpose, God. Secondly, where do you look to for compassion and care as you go through suffering? Do you see here Jesus' compassion for those who suffer? Someone has put it this way, that Jesus is the only God with scars. He did not remain disengaged from suffering. He became a person, was born into poverty, engaged with suffering, a person acquainted with grief, and then suffered himself on the cross. So that he is uniquely equipped as God to say to you, whatever you're going through, that I care about you and I know what you're going through. He can draw alongside us in our suffering and grief because he himself is not disengaged with our suffering and grief. Compassion to those who are suffering. Our second point is hope of an end to suffering. One of the things I know many, many people have been doing is looking to the news or looking to social media to try to look at the pandemic curve and try to see both how we're flattening the curve and secondly, how long the tail of the curve is likely to be. That is, how long is this gonna go on for? And one of the reasons we're doing that is because we're seeking hope, hope of an end of this very particular pandemic and this particular suffering that we're facing. Well, in verse 14, Jesus gives us precious hope of an end to all suffering. Then he, Jesus, went up and touched the bier they were carrying him on. And the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Well, initially you may say, look, these events didn't happen. This is a myth. This is not history. People don't come back from the dead. Well, please note that Luke doesn't write this as a myth. He writes it as history. He gives details like the place, name, and the people who are involved. And his gospel was in wide circulation by late AD 60. So people at the time would have been able to verify or falsify these events. But notice as Luke records these events as history, what he focuses on. Jesus touched the buyer. That detail seems to almost slow down and control the whole narrative because it's so significant. 
I've already talked about the way in Old Testament times, if you touched certain things like disease or death or blood, then you were deemed ceremonially unclean. So Jesus doesn't need to touch the funeral by here. And it's shocking that he does. He doesn't need to because in the earlier part of chapter seven, he's just healed a centurion servant when he's not even in physical proximity. No, by touching the funeral bar, he's making a really important point. Uh, we've become very aware of our touch at the moment, haven't we? Because of isolation. And that's the whole reason for it, so that we don't contaminate one another by touch. Just a small droplet of saliva on our hands and we touch even a surface and another person touched that surface, it could contaminate them. So we're suddenly very, very conscious of the importance of touch. Well, here's the question. Is Jesus' touch like our touch? That is that when he comes into contact with something like disease or death, he is contaminated by it. Or is his touch much more like what we hope will happen soon, a cure or a vaccine for COVID-19? And of course, when a cure or a vaccine comes into contact with something that is infected, it doesn't become infected. Rather, it cures or it brings immunity to the infected person or party. So which is Jesus? Is he like us or is he like the vaccine? We'll look again at verse 14. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They're wonderful words, aren't they? Jesus gave him back to his mother. What makes them so wonderful is that they breathe fresh hope into a situation of death. Part of what makes death so awful, as the Bible sees it, is it is the terrible judgment on our rejection of God, our sin. You know, we're conscious at the moment that many people have a condition in this world, up to a million people formally diagnosed with COVID-19, and probably many, many more where the true figures to be known. But as ubiquitous as coronavirus is at the moment in the world, it's nothing compared to the condition that every human being has, regardless of age, or ethnicity, or gender, or background, sin. Our rejection of God, the way that every person instinctively turns away from God, who is the source of all life and goodness. And in so doing, God gives us over in judgment to the consequence of that decision, to death, and to a fallen world with things like disease and isolation in. But wonderfully, Jesus comes to give hope. He comes to take away death. How does he do that? Well, he, the source of all life, eventually dies on a cross so that we might have life. He, the pure one, who gives a healing touch, is touched by death on the cross so that we might be healed and set free. Dr. Amgad Al-Harani was tragically the first doctor in the UK to die of coronavirus. His brother described him after his death as a hero. And in the truest sense of the word, he is a hero because a hero lays down his life for others. It's the sacrifice of love. That's why the greatest act of heroism the world has ever known was when Jesus died on a cross. He lived the perfect life that we should live, but we don't. And then he died the death that we deserve to die for our sin, for the way that we turn away from God and don't live with reference to him. We don't want him in our lives. We try to do things our own way. And in so doing, Jesus took the penalty of our sin on himself. He took the judgment and the anger that God has at the way we reject him and all that's wrong with the world. He died so that we might have life. He was cursed so that we might be accepted. He took the penalty of sin so that we might be forgiven our sin and so that he might bring to us a healing touch. And those precious words that Jesus gave him back to his mother, it's worth pausing for a moment and thinking about what it is that you are most feeling despair about at the moment, where you're lacking hope. What is it that's being taken away from you or threatens to be taken away from you that you're really worried about? Maybe you're worried about your job being taken away from you. Maybe your loved ones being taken away from you. Maybe you feel a loss of autonomy that that's been taken away from you. Maybe a loss of freedom that's been taken away from you. Well, the wonderful reality and the hope of the gospel is that when there is an end to all suffering, 
when Jesus wraps up this world and brings in the new creation, makes all things new, he will give back everything that we've lost and far, far more. Loved ones restored to us in a relationship if we trust in him. Freedom given back to us where we might feel isolated and shut in. Nothing to worry about or fear about. Our health fully restored, never to decay, never to grow old. As it says in the wonderful book, The Lord of the Rings, everything that is bad becomes untrue. What a wonderful day that will be. And when we stand there and Jesus gives all of those things back to us, if we trust in him, what will our response be? Well, look at verse 16. They were all filled with awe and praised God. I know that one of the questions that we're all being forced to ask at the moment is where we look to for compassion and where we look to for hope in this lockdown season. And one of the challenges is that so many of the things that we would traditionally look to for those have been stripped away from us. Maybe friends and family that we can't be physically with and we're seeing over video call, but it's just not the same, is it? Um, maybe jobs that we'd rely on for security um, and therefore would give us some sense of hope in a situation like this have been taken away from us. So many of our sources of hope and the people we've turned to for compassion are not with us at the moment. And that's part of what makes it so hard. But I hope you see that as we've asked this question, where is God in this pandemic, that he is there offering us compassion if we will turn to him in faith. And he is there offering us sure and certain hope because of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that one day there will be an end to all suffering. One day he will give everything back to us that we have lost if we trust in him. Well, as we look forward to that day, can I encourage you to draw near to him by faith? to trust in him, to look to him for your compassion that you need to get through this moment, to look to him for hope that will sustain you in the midst of this lockdown season. Only he is able to promise those things and give those things to us, but they are available to us if we will trust in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ, we see your compassion and we see real hope of an end to all suffering. We do pray, of course, for an end to coronavirus, Lord God, and we know that you will work through governments and medics to bring that about in due time, and it will indeed end. But Lord, we long all the more for an end to all suffering. So Lord God, reassure us of the hope of the gospel and of that day when all things are made new through the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us in the meantime to trust in him as our source of compassion and hope, we pray. For his name's sake. Amen. Well, one of the Psalms that Christians have turned to over the years for compassion and for hope is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And Rebecca is now going to lead us as we sing together. So would you please stand as we sing.
is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe. This gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. And every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curses are lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand Father God, we thank and praise you for the hope that is found exclusively in Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would strengthen us in that hope right now. That we could say and believe, as we've just sung, that he is our light, our strength, our song. And so build our lives each day on him, our cornerstone, this solid ground. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. Before I close us with a final blessing, do check out our website where we've got some daily devotionals and other resources to help you um, right now. Uh, our Inspire groups continue to meet um, every Wednesday evening over Zoom. If you're not in one and you'd like to be, please email admin at inspirelondon.org. And that's the same email to use if you'd like to find out more about the mutual aid groups from Diana or if there's any specific prayer or practical help that you need. But for now, may you know God's comfort and help at this time. May you be strengthened to keep finding your hope in him. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.